Now, some important economic figures were published yesterday. They showed an unexpected rise in unemployment, but also a rise in average weekly earnings and signs that productivity growth is also increasing. The government has talked a lot about Britain's historically low unemployment rate, and Chancellor Philip Hammond said this was more evidence that it is succeeding in creating an economy fit for the future. That wasn't the view of Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell, who has been speaking about living standards today. Working people and those on low and middle incomes especially have suffered the worst decade for living standards for generations, perhaps as far back as the Napoleonic Wars. And the prognosis for the future is well, similarly bleak, uh, with at best marginal recovery, but for many stagnating living standards. That was John McDonnell, who has also endorsed a report by the think tank class led by my guest of the day, Pfizer Shaheen. It says that despite record employment, many British workers are overworked, underpaid, stressed and beset with job insecurity and wage stagnation. It conducted a survey of 2,000 people and says 80% of them expected to be poorer over the next year. Well, to discuss this, we're joined by the Conservative MP Kwasi Kwarteng. He's an aide to the Chancellor, Philip Hammond. Welcome to the studio. Hello. Just take us through your survey and those figures you say 80% expect to be poorer that doesn't mean they will be poorer no but I think there's something very important about how workers feel and feel about the economy and if it's working for them so if if after 10 years of very poor wage growth historically poor wage growth they still don't think that they are going to get an above inflation pay rise then that tells us something about you know their insecurities how much they might go out and spend and um, there was other statistics that really stood out for me for instance that three and in four people don't feel that the economy works for them and um, 20 percent now taking on a second job another 20 percent that have considered it so, you know, this is really um, a, lots of signs uh, that people are finding our labour market inc incredibly precarious and perilous. Right, but finding it perilous is not the same as saying they will definitely be worse off in 12 months' time. Do you think you've misrepresented the survey and the interviews that you've done by saying how people are fear feeling and conflating that with what will actually happen? Look, we use a lot of economic indicators right now about the way business feels or consumer feels. It's only right that the 31 million workers have, you know, or 32 million even, that we have a temperature check of what they feel is working for them and we should be listening. Right. Right. I mean, the job figures, we know, they speak for themselves in terms of the numbers, although there has been, of course, this rise um, in unemployment the first time in many years, in fact. Um, do you accept, though, that when it comes to wages, if real incomes are falling and they've been stagnating now for 10 years, people feel worse off? And yeah. they are worse off. Well, I think I, I would accept that. Um, but I would also say there is a context which you mentioned. We have record uh, people in employment for the last 40 years. I think the work you do is commendable and that people needs, the concerns of people need to be addressed. Uh, the Prime Minister herself, when she became Prime Minister, mentioned the fact that uh, precariousness in employment uh, was an issue. There was the Matthew Taylor Review, which is looking exactly at these sorts of issues. But let's not lose sight of uh, some of the data. Uh, we've, got, we've had a national living wage, which was introduced for the first time in 2016, at £7.20, I believe. That is now 7 83 That's an increase of about 9%. We have, uh, as uh, Joe uh, mentioned, we've got record numbers of people uh, in employment, when many people predicted that there'd be a, a rash of, uh, of unemployment and unemployment would spike. That, thankfully, hasn't happened. I think you've got, uh, people mentioned zero-hours contracts. Uh, you haven't, but people do. But 2.8% of the workforce has zero-hours uh, contracts. So that's not something which uh, is, is universally felt across uh, the piece. So while it's fair enough uh, for your think tank to look at some of the difficulties, I think there, there is an overarching story of, of considerable success in this, in this Do area. Do you accept some of the successful data? No, I think a lot of that data clouds what's really happening. The headline employment figures completely do not capture the hardship that people face day to day and the levels of stress. We spoke to someone that told us about half of mental health workers themselves feeling that they've got mental health problems and feeling like failures. That's very serious. That's a sign that the economy is not working. We're not putting people and our people's health first. What would you do? So look, there's a number of things we can do. Um, the National, essentially, it's the minimum wage still, and um, they called it the national living, living wage. wage. Uh, but we need a real living wage commission that actually does speak to people's real costs. 
and we know that people are in huge amounts of debt, so they're finding it very hard to make ends meet. And we need to do something ultimately about power. This isn't just something that has happened in the last few years since Brexit or happened you know, under Conservatives, to be fair. This is a long-term thing. What we've seen is workers have less power, less say in the workplace, and less ability to barter with their bosses. We need to do something to have higher levels of collective bargaining again. And when we look at countries that do have better workplace environments, higher wages, etc., they are places that have stronger trade unions, stronger collective bargaining. That's just the truth of it. Right. And let's go back to that core issue, which has resulted in the stress that has been felt by people thinking that they just cannot afford to make ends meet. How is the government going to address the fact that although wages have risen yeah. just recently, they are still not keeping pace with inflation? Inflation is not coming down at the moment. Now, it may come down in a year or two's time. What are people supposed to do in between? I think what we're trying to do in terms of the medium term uh, strategy is to look at productivity. Everyone knows that increasing productivity is going to be the key to, to getting better growth and higher wages. We want to have a higher wage economy. And I think with respect to uh, the higher wages that people were getting, we're investing in skills. We look at apprenticeships. The government's done a whole range of things. Right, but when which did productivity is trying to upskill. start to rise? Well, actually, if you look at the figures yesterday... Well, yeah, yesterday. The, 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 well, I mean, those figures were announced yesterday. Sure. They're, not, they're not yesterday's But they are figures. the most they're, recent figures. They productivity are the most recent. has been they are the very most, sluggish. Yeah, it has been quite sluggish. We accept that. And the OBR re revised down growth figures on the back of that. I happen to think as many officials do, that we're turning the corner on that. But we'll have to wait and see. Right. Do you agree that productivity is key? I mean, Jeremy Corbyn has talked an awful lot about policies that should focus on increasing productivity for British workers. Now these figures suggest that that is happening. Do you applaud that? Look, there's a couple of things that you need to do to make sure that productivity goes up. There's no puzzle, actually. What we haven't had is the investment in recent years in equipment and various different things. And that's public investment as well as private investment. And that will help. But look, sometimes productivity is used as a bit of a get out of jail card to be honest you don't expect productivity in sectors like care or hairdressing like you don't know how that's going to look so you know Productivity is a bit of an old uh, measure in economics again. And so we have to really rethink some of those areas about how we talk about wage growth. And again, when you look at the evidence, the number one thing that is affecting wages is that fall in, in labour share, which is to do with the lack of power, the ability to say to, to bosses, you're not going to get that pay rise. Instead, we're going to share that out or we're so not going to give you, that shareholders. I just that? say two things. I think productivity, you may think, is an old fashioned uh, measure, but it's absolutely critical to the long term uh, future, the basis of growth. Mm, but what about what about in sectors where that isn't? The, as the second, the second thing I would say is that you you represent a think tank. Now you're saying that the the answer is more collective bargaining power, uh, more unionisation. That I would say is a political uh, debate. I didn't happen to agree with you. I don't think that having huge amounts of uh, trade union power that we had in the 1970s is going to be the answer uh, to more pro uh, prosperity. But that's clearly a political view that you have. That's not a that's, that's not actually a function just of based research. on evidence. That's though. not a, f a function. I mean, the of OECD your, and the World Bank. That is not your function of your thing. research. That's a political view that you happen to take about the uh, merits of unionisation. Right. Quasi Pfizer says the government should introduce a policy that entitles workers to extra compensation for overworking. The majority of people working extra hours told the report that they get no extra pay. Should that be dealt with? I, I have no idea. I haven't read the report. I'm sorry about that. I know the main uh, headline findings. But I don't think that that's necessarily something that the government can legislate uh, for. I think we've got lots well, of private businesses. Well, the Taylor Review did point to some of those things. And the problem is we had the Taylor Review and all that's happened is that mm. there's going to be more consultations and this problem is just being kicked down the road. No, I don't and think in it the is. meantime, in the meantime, you know, people are telling us very strongly that they are finding it very difficult. And when you look at other other indicators like household debt, which is back to near record levels, that's not an economy that is successful. If it's not working for workers, then who is it working for? Do you accept I, that even if you look at the data that is favourable, as you would say, in, lots broad, of data that's in broad macro very, terms, look absolutely. at unemployment, um, we can look the, at the living, fact that wages are rising. Wage, so, all yeah, of that, yeah. But, but in the end, if mm. people say they cannot afford to live, are you saying you're wrong? No, I'm not and saying the that. Figures are, well, when will the Treasury be prepared to embrace the fact that so many people do feel that they are not going to be better off in future years? I'm not going to sit here and say it's a bed of roses and everything is fine. Clearly, people are under a lot of stress. But you've got to look at the direction of travel. I think there have been huge successes, as you have yourself have, have realised and accepted. And I think we are going to improve. I think the productivity figures are going to improve. Uh, clearly, the employment uh, figures are as good as I mean, in terms of people in jobs. And let me put it the other way. If, for whatever reason, we had a serious problem with unemployment, 
people like yourselves, rightly, and the political opposition would be making hay about this. And the fact is that we actually have very good employment figures. And are you surprised by I'm that? Has that surprised you, um, that unemployment has been so low? Not really, because what we've seen over the years is, is a growth in jobs, but the quality of those jobs hasn't been questioned. And so that's really the critical thing, because having a bad job can be as bad as sure. for your mental health as having a job at all, not having a job at all. So, you know, look, we need to, we can do better than this, is my yeah. point, and we need to do better for this, because people are on the brink here. They are telling us, like I say, um, that this is very, very hard for them to manage. And the big thing, of course, that needs to happen is the public spending cuts need to end, because a public sector workers above everyone else in this report were shouting loudest about worker intensification, about how difficult their workplaces have become to carry that yeah. workload. Well, we can have a debate about the quality of jobs. I think that's a good debate to be having, because in another context, uh, we would be talking about unemployment. We'd be talking about millions of people, as one of the uh, MPC members of the Bank of England sure, but predicted. Sure, it doesn't have to be either he or, He predicted does it? that there would be five million unemployed. Right. The fact that we're having this debate, I think, is a sign of success. Well, and you can go and tell uh, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor. <laughs>